Hey folks, welcome back. After months of intense, nuanced negotiations, the federal government finally passed what has been hailed in American media as the biggest investment in infrastructure of the generation. Or, as other countries might call it, uh, the bare minimum. That's right folks, today I'm going to be looking at the details of the infrastructure bill that just passed. If you like the boring nuances of public policy or are interested in the different ways corporations try to game the system no matter what's in place, then this video will be for you. First, let's start with, you know, what's actually in the bill. 110 billion going to roads, bridges, and other major projects. 66 billion going to passenger and freight rail. 32 billion for public transit. 65 billion for broadband. This is probably one of the neater provisions because you know, like paying money for bridges, okay, we <laughs> they're literally collapsing on us. That's kind of a necessity, but pushing for a new bit of infrastructure like expanding broadband to rural or other communities that don't always have the greatest access to these interwebs. That right there's some neato stuff. 16 and a half billion to ports and waterways. 25 billion to improve our airports. 55 billion for water infrastructure. Particularly, uh, finally getting around to try to get rid of lead pipes, which I can't believe it's taken us uh, what is it to the year 2021 to figure that shit out? 65 billion for power and grid, which basically just sounds like it's trying to prepare against more situations like what Texas went through last year. Or was that this year? Time's fucking irrelevant. Seven and a half billion for clean school buses and ferries, which is basically just trying to replace some of the, the, the carbon guzzling buses and ferries with zero emission ones or at least zero emission past the time that it's manufactured. Seven and a half billion going to electric vehicle charging. Great, this is a vital part of making, you know, electrical vehicles, vehicles viable for you, the, the everyman. 21 billion for addressing legacy pollution, which basically just seems to be cleaning up old like mines and gas wells. 8 billion for Western water infrastructure, which I think is separate from other forms of water infrastructure just because Areas like Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, California uh, have been struggling with droughts as of late. Interesting, I wonder if there's some general climate trend we could trace back there. So those are the major new provisions, but one very important point of order, which it actually took me a few minutes to Google around to find the, the answer for, because depending on which outlet you're looking at, They'll either cite the top line number as 1.2 trillion or 550 billion, which as you can see from the distance at which I'm holding my hands is a different number. And that's because about half of the spending bill is just continuing programs that already existed. Uh, but in general, it is a solid 550 billion in new spending is really what we're talking about when we list all of these programs. Now, of course, with this much new money being spent, it was inevitable and in fact practical to have some of it paid for. So let's take a moment to look at how this bill is paying for itself. Before we do, I wanna shout out the fact that one of the more worrying provisions from earlier negotiations is no longer a pay for. Back in August, it was being talked about that the bill would be paid for by asset recycling which to truncate a rather complicated subject basically means that you sell a piece of public infrastructure to some sort of private company and would have put those funds back into these new infrastructure projects. For example, selling some sort of public water plant for, I don't know, 2 billion or something like that and then using that 2 billion to improve nearby bridges. Hey folks, editing Piley here. I realize I forgot to explain exactly why asset recycling was a worrying sign, so let me do that. So when these utilities get sold off to private companies, their only way to get a return on their investment is to either cut like labor or maintenance costs, which either contributes to the ever dwindling standard of living that working Americans are used to, or like we saw in Texas, 
It means the infrastructure is not adequately prepared for disaster because to the private company, the cost benefit analysis may have said that maintenance was not necessary. The other way for these companies to make a profit is to charge the users up front, which ends up being like a form of a regressive tax. If you want a clear example of how bad these public-private partnerships, which is just another word for asset recycling, can be for the regular person, look no further than Virginia. Some of the roads in the state maintained by private corporations are the most expensive in the country, and other toll systems like the bridge and tunnels that connect Norfolk and Portsmouth got so expensive for the average working class American that had to use them, the localities had to subsidize the private company to the tune of 300 million because they were charging so damn much. So it was this sort of regressive tax that I was worried about hitting working Americans down the road when it sounded like asset recycling was on the table. But in everything that I've been able to read, and I haven't read the bill itself, but I have read quite a few summaries on the piece, asset recycling is thankfully not one of the pay-fors for this bill. But more to the point, let's get to what pay-fors are in the bill. About half of the money offsetting new spending is just repurposing money from COVID-19 relief funds. And another tenth of the money is chalked up to dynamic scoring, which is just estimating what the policy changes would save down the line. Which means the other 40% of the new money is paid for with smaller things like selling off petroleum reserves. Now, a couple of these provisions are where the bill gets really weird and really interesting to me. For example, about 50 billion comes from delaying a Medicare rebate, which, to my attempt to understand this subject reading through a few articles, was a policy instituted at the end of Trump's turn, which tried to shift where the rebates are affecting the healthcare system. For example, at the moment, they go back toward manufacturers and insurance providers, whereas Medicare Part D rebates were trying to put those savings up front. But there was a healthy debate, quite a bit of which went above your boy's head, as to whether or not this would actually save money, or if it would just mean that the healthcare companies would instead just keep raising their prices to, you know, cover their asses. Which I guess shouldn't be a surprise at this point. Of course, healthcare companies of all companies w would turn attempts to make it cheaper for the consumer into a means of assisting their bottom line. Like, this is the American healthcare system we're talking about. But anyways, that's not the weird part of this funding. The weird part is the rebate was scheduled to start next year. According to the Congressional Budget Office, it would have cost billions of extra dollars a year. But I will repeat, the policy was not instituted. It was proposed, but it never became a reality. And to my understanding, it was never a part of previous budgets. But the infrastructure bill further delays that rebate till the end of 2026 and repurposes the supposed savings, according to the CBO, as a pay for for this bill, but it's money that <laughs> what we didn't, the money wasn't there before. We weren't spending it on that program in the past. So is it just coming out of thin air? It's really bizarre. And it sounds like a weird sleight of hand to try to make it sound like the, the bill has a less impact on the deficit than it does. So that's a weird one to keep an eye on. And I honestly don't even understand if this counts as a pay for uh, if there was never money there. But other than that, there's some money made from, I think, the FCC selling wavelengths. There's some money from cryptocurrency reporting requirements, but it honestly seems more like a, a tax on large transactions of cryptocurrency. Fine by me. And some other weird little line items like that. So considering all the new projects it brings into the fold and all of the ways that it manages to pay for itself, how good, ultimately, is this bill? From everything I've read about it, as nice as it is to know that, like, we'll finally be getting rid of lead water pipes or we'll be expanding broadband infrastructure to more rural communities, I struggle to have any emotional reaction other than just, eh. Like, I can't exactly hype myself up for fixing the bridges that are falling apart because that's a fucking mandatory function of having governance, you know? 
And it's a sad reflection on our state of affairs when a bill that is essentially the bare minimum is still such a big deal. Like even the minimal amount this bill puts towards carbon neutral school buses and electrical vehicle charging is still a weirdly big deal considering the lack of climate initiatives that have passed through Congress. It might not even be a lie that this is the largest climate change investment in US history. I'm sure it is. It's just not that much. Because of course, and this transitions us well into the next talking point, the cost of doing this in a bipartisan manner, a lot of the climate change physical infrastructure had to be cut out of the physical infrastructure bill. Now this original democratic proposal likely wouldn't have been the final result because of again, a few senators like either Fred Warner or Joe Manchin probably would have whittled some of these numbers down on their own. But just as the clearest baseline we'll ever get, let's compare the original proposal to what happens when you bring Republicans into the mix. You lose $360 billion in clean energy tax credits. That's right, Republicans have issue with fucking tax credits. Why? Oh, because it's climate change shit, apparently. You lose almost $400 billion going to public housing. You lose $560 billion to research and development in manufacturing. You know, the sort of thing to keep our manufacturing base top of the line going into the 21st century. The money towards broadband is cut by 35%. The water infrastructure is cut in half. Public transportation is cut in half. Electric vehicles is cut by 10%. Yeah, the largest climate investment in US history lost 90% of electric vehicle funding. Which, as a related tangent to this bill in general, uh, it fills my, my little heart with so much climate-filled dread, knowing that the obstacle to major initiatives on climate change is all these conservative politicians we have up in the place. When I'm trying to survive the post-apocalypse and I'm being chased by a Mad Max style band of raiders because I took a case of water to feed my kids, I'm gonna be sure to thank Joe Biden uh, for taking this bill the bipartisan route, which literally wasn't necessary. And the climate change initiatives really are a good summary of this bill on a whole. Like it does some nice things. It brings broadband into more rural areas. It improves bridges, a lot of which are in rural areas. But on the whole, it's still just, you know, not enough. We don't need 39 billion going into public transportation. We need a wider shift to a holistic public transportation economy if we have any hopes of trying to stave off climate change. Or, like, take for another example, how this bill impacts organized labor. While a lot of the hype surrounding what the bill will do for labor unions really just have to do with increased business, like, sure, if you give highway systems more money to repair themselves, you will have union crews, in all likelihood, doing a lot of that work. But that's just kind of a byproduct of the funding. That's not really anything the bill is on its own doing. There are little provisions, like the fact that some of the broadband money is given preference to companies with a record of following labor and employment laws, which is nice, but it's important to note that's 42 billion going to broadband funding. That's not going to every provision in this bill. It is not as if all $1.2 trillion have to go to entities that have a good history of following employment law. It's just this $42 billion. So like even the extent to which it supports organized labor is very minimal and certainly there's a framework literally right in the bill to make that more substantial. Now let's transition to talking about some of the tea. As underwhelming as the bill generally is, it's brings a smile to my face to see the, the apocalyptic seething of some Republicans. Spineless Republicans decided to tag team with Democrats and helped pass their $5 trillion socialist takeover of our country, which is just a baffling lie, no matter how you look at even the difference between new spending versus old spending. That's just not true communist takeover of America via so-called infrastructure. I can't believe Republicans just gave Democrats their socialism bill. 
Yeah, the bill in which one of the main provisions for getting broadband internet into rural communities is making bond projects to private activity eligible for broadband infrastructure. Yeah, that's socialism. It's just a buzzword at this point. It's like woke. Woke means any sort of social agenda that conservatives don't like. Communist means any sort of economic spending that isn't just to cops or the military. Like repairing a bridge, funding a road, is not communism in really any serious definition of the word. So if you'll join me, let's take a minute to just soak in all of this absolute seething from these fucking ghouls. And then we have the defectors, if you will, on the final vote in the House. You have the six progressives that make up the squad who all decided to vote against it. And if you saw that top line figure, you might say to yourself, oh no, the bill, oh, it crashed and burned. Uh, but they had the support of 13 Republicans, which to get a little in the weeds about this, uh, really makes me think that these protest votes are very specifically uh, the, the last plea to sort of keep people having faith in this shithole of a party. Because if there were zero Republican votes, they would have, I think, needed everyone on board. We've seen situations where like only one or two of them vote against a thing, and that just so happens to be their margin of error. So I'm not saying that they aren't actually frustrated at what's going on, but it does feel convenient that they were given the space to kind of have this protest vote, because without it, there would be quite a lot more frustration from people who want to see the party go in a progressive direction. Like, and it's funny, you know, as long as he's been in this business, <laughs> you saw Jank Uger celebrating, I think, that there's six people in Congress still fighting for us. And it's like, I, who knows? I don't think they, all six of them would have voted no if they didn't have the freedom to. Them voting no versus them voting yes, it didn't matter. They had the votes without them. So it does feel like the overwhelming margin, because you might think they would have just gotten like six Republicans or whatever, um, so that the, their margin was as many as they needed. But it does seem like the Pelosi tried to get a hefty margin so that they could have their little protest vote, um, and that, that would help people still feel like there's a chance. Like this party isn't totally corporate and unwilling to deliver on its promises. You just gotta believe in these six people, y'all. Hey folks, editing Piley again. The protest vote also plays into their typical pitch that they oh so desperately want to do more, they just need wider margins. Which is of course BS, they had some of the widest margins of the modern era in 2009 and they still didn't really deliver on what the American people wanted. But nonetheless, the protest vote gives a sliver of credence to the vote more Democrats argument. But anyways, that's about all I have to say for today, folks. This is an ever ongoing process. There's plenty more that I could rant on about with this bill. Then I think I'm just kind of done thinking about this <laughs> absolute bare minimum piece of policy for the moment. But thank you for sticking around and watching everybody. Be sure to toss me a like and subscribe down below. But if you really want to help me out, you can join me over on Patreon. Patrons get access to exclusive behind-the-scenes content like early versions of every video and exclusive Patreon-only videos. Plus, if you join the Piley Benton's Biggest Boys tier, you get your name read off at the end of every video, which I am about to do once I pull up the names. Zoth, Revo Pregame, Emily, Kyle Foley, Jennifer Jones, Caffeine Unicorn, Goblin of the Year, Stockwell Homestead, Milik Elites, and Cameron Fordo. So if you want to hear your lovely name read off at the end of every video, be sure to join me on this specific tier. Thanks much, everyone, and I'll see you next time.